Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining me for this session, How to Decolonize Your Mind. Uh, I am Professor Kyandi Andrews, uh, Professor of Black Studies at Birmingham City University. Um, the idea about decolonizing is important because if you've been involved in the festival, hopefully you've been involved in some of the discussions um, around just how unequal society is and the, the need to decolonize society more broadly. It's probably one of the most urgent and pressing needs of the 21st century. And that process starts with starts at home. It starts with changing the way in which we think about the basic premises of society. So the decolonized mind is important because once we decolonize the mind, hopefully then we start to see the world differently and to act differently. A society can only be as equal as the knowledge which is built upon. And unfortunately, or unsurprisingly, uh, the knowledge that base, the knowledge and myths that underpin this society are incredibly unequal, delusional and distorted. So it is therefore essential as any process of change that we kind of undo that, undo the lie that we've been sold about how we got to where we are and where we are going. So over the next half an hour, a little bit less than half an hour, I am going to uh, kind of give a, a path, a path to a different way of understanding things, which hopefully uh, will be uncomfortable, which hopefully will shake some of the foundations. And if not, maybe you know some of this stuff will hopefully allow you, give you a blueprint to sharing it uh, more broadly as well. All right, so how to decolonize your mind. First things first, really, it is about understanding the nature of the problem. And the nature of this particular problem is the lie. There's big lies that we've been sold to, um, the myths that underpin how we understand the world. And it is these, it is these lies and these myths which uh, continue to mean that we can only understand the world in very distorted and problematic ways. So in order to decolonize your mind, the first thing to do is to destabilize these myths, to debunk them. It's absolutely essential. So the first part of doing that is understanding what the lie is. So one of the, the way these kind of lies work, and I've kind of tried to put it in a circle, because it, it does revolve around the idea of revolution. And where we, and I've, I've heard this a number of times actually this, this over this weekend, with the um, in the debates, this progress narrative. You know, the West is all about progress, and it's about these massive revolutions in science, politics, and in industry. Uh, we are led to believe that the three pillars of the West are sci the scientific revolution, the political revolution, and the industrial revolution. And it's those things which have, have made progress and given us the technology where we are today. And that's not a hundred percent untrue, right? Without science changing, moving away from religious explanations um, and rationality and you know, the, the maths, physics, etc. Without that, we really couldn't have the, te well, the technology that we're literally sitting on, we're doing this with, would be, would be impossible without science. So there is truth, some truth in the idea that Western science has been really important in terms of development. Uh, the same truth is true with industry, right? Industry, the industrial revolution uh, in the 18th century onwards, is seen to be one of the, the big moments of change where the science, uh, the, the science and rationality was put to use and put to work, changed how things were produced, allowed there to be plenty. If you think about what's the big difference now is that we just have so much stuff, so much material wealth, and that was produced by the Industrial Revolution, which started in you know, Britain, Europe, and expanded out to the world. So again, there's, there's truth to that. And then the third part of this, of this myth is the political revolutions. So, um, moving away from monarchies and being governed by heredity and having democracy, et cetera, et cetera. And this being really important because it gives us the frames of rights and, and those frames of rights and the individual, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the three things which are seen to um, embed, embedded on the lie of the West. And these are the three things which we're, the West is supposed to give into the world. And if only everybody else could just catch up with science, industry, politics, uh, wouldn't the world be a better place? Now, I say that's all partly true because it is part. It is partly true. There is some truth to that, but there is a another side to this. None of these things, scientific revolution, industrial revolution, or political revolution, could have happened without some of the worst atrocities ever committed by humankind. There is a there is a dark side to modernity, which is just as important as the wonderfully good, um, progressed, uh, professed values uh, that the West is supposed to be built on. We, one of the first things we want to think about when decolonizing the mind is to shift the idea from these, these so-called good 
West, so-called Western and so-called good values or British values that we say in the UK, and to understand that genocide, slavery, and colonialism are equally as important, if not more important, uh, than the, so the than, than the good sides of Western development. So when we're thinking about uh, decolonizing the mind as a quote, I mean, if you have heard me talk before, you definitely would have heard me use Malcolm X uh, references. Um, and Malcolm talks about the change which happens uh, when we hear a different telling of history as like snow falling off a roof. And this was from Malcolm when he heard about racism. And you know, he's in prison, he's at the bottom. Um, he's, he's literally just, he's, he's, at the, he's at the worst point of his life. And he's reading and learning stuff. And he's just completely, and that process of learning was like snow falling off a roof. He literally transformed it. Uh, from a hustler um, into a statesman. And so this is hopefully what can happen through the process of decolonizing your mind, to, be to, to, to have your eyes opened um, and to see the world anew. So that's why it's really important to destabilize those three myths about how great the West is and how great things are today. So I'm gonna go, we're going to go back. Do this, we're going to have to go back and tell a different story about the West the story again. Some of you may be uh, well aware of, and some of you may not. Um, but this is a really important retelling of history. So, before we go back, and actually, no, this is going back. Actually, this is going back to one of our really important scientists. So, when we think about science, and we think about scientific revolution, we think about rationality and classification. Uh, one of the supposed benefits of science over religion is the idea that you see the world through. Object, through objective lens, you see the world through rationality, you don't have the same uh, kind of uh, subjective, oppressive view, right? Um, unfortunately, though, so you would think that would be the case, and the shift from religious explanations to scientific explanations should, in this logic, mean that there is a more equal understanding of the human world. However, it was exactly the opposite. The shift from religious explanations of humanity and uh, who, uh, pr prior to the Enlightenment and to science, it was all about who had a soul, who could have a soul. Do Africans have souls? Do Native Americans have souls? It was all about so who, who has souls. Understanding difference from scientific rationality became who has the right biology, who has the right genes, who has the right genetic code. And this is from uh, Claude Linnaeus, one of the really important botanists in the 18th century, who is still today actually really important in terms of how uh, human classification and classification of other species is used. Basically classifies uh, the human species and very clearly classifies in this way. So it says at the top of the human species, there is Europaeus albus, who is ingenious, white, sanguine, governed by law, as the top of the human pyramid. Then you have Americus rubiscus, happy with his lot, liberty loving, tanned, and irascible, and governed by custom. And after, after Americus rubiscus, uh, you then have Asiatic luridus yellow, melancholy, and governed by opinion, until finally you get to the bottom of the human pyramid, and you have Afer Niger, crafty, lazy, black, governed by the arbitrary will of the master. And you can see them through scientific classification in the 18th century of humanity. Now, I picked out Linnaeus because it's so clear, and it's so color-coded, white, red, yellow, black, uh, to show the hierarchy of humanity, but he's certainly not alone. Emmanuel Kant, Voltaire, uh, Rousseau, um, everybody. I mean, all the, basically all the Enlightenment thinkers, read any of them, and they had a similar, sometimes the, the order dif differed in between, but white at the top, black at the bottom, all of them classified human species, the human species into a different species often, uh, certainly different people, and certainly a hierarchy of white supremacy at the top. The idea being here that only white people can think only white people can be rational, and Africans are far closer to, to um, animals. Well, actually, not even far closer to animals, in many of these are actually just animals. This is what becomes discussing up to date in this um, program. We've had this, you know, about the human rights element, the rationality element, all these positive things that come from the Enlightenment. However, you can't separate them from the racial science of the Enlightenment. Um, because someone like Kant, for example, who's really important in terms of rights and actually lays the framework for human rights that we have today, uh, makes it very clear that actually his work on race, which is just classic racism, and his work on rights cannot be separated. Only Europeans, only white people have the ability to be fully rational. 
And to some extent, you should give rights to everybody in the world, but they should not be the same rights. So the right to life, which is embedded in the human rights framework, is the basic. I mean, animals have the right to life. This is not give you the right to fulfillment and, and humanity. And that right of humanity has never been granted to those who are black. So this is a really important point to make, right? Now, it's not just a philosophical point. This is not just a discussion about, uh, well, you know, are there different ways that we can conceive, uh, conceive of the human, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This actually is what global inequality looks like today. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.